Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alberto, and thank you to Michael for providing a segue to what I'd like to speak about. And this is uh, the notion Michael mentioned, observing system design. So I'd like to talk about broadly this idea of optimal experimental design for inverse problems posed in the Bayesian context. So this is the meta question, so to speak, of data assimilation. How do we choose the data in the first place in order to best inform the models, best inform the inference? Of course, best and it depends on your perspective. My perspective will be to gain the most information about the system as mentioned, uh, as, as measured by the information gain. Okay, so uh, let's see if this works. Uh, it does not work. That's, I think the battery is dead. That's okay, I'll stand here uh, and I'll point with, uh, can you see the, the pointer? Yeah, I think you can. Uh, okay. So um, let me start off with a few examples of the kinds of problems we're working on that are posed to take this next step to data simula to uh, optimal experimental design. That works, okay? Um, that works. Uh, that can point with it, okay? With this one, thank you. Uh, so this is the flow of the Antarctic ice sheet, and this is a uh, inverse problem in which we are trying to infer the uncertain boundary condition at the base of the ice. So we have satellite observations of the surface velocity, NSAR, and th that's an image there of the surface velocity. What we'd like to do is recover the, uh, effectively, a Roban boundary condition. There's a coefficient that plays the role of friction, basal friction. This provides resistance to the sliding of the, of the ice at the base due to you know, rock adhe ice adhering to rocks. So we have a no-slip condition or ice sliding freely on till or sediment, uh, or the fluids, fluids that are transported beneath the ice. Uh, so uh, this, this, this is an inversion here. This is essentially the, the map point, the maximum a posteriori estimate in the upper left, and it shows large regions of little resistance to sliding of the ice, extending deep into the interior of Antarctica. Of course, this says nothing about the uncertainty. Uh, so one can um, then do a Laplace approximation, which is essentially a Gaussian approximation of the posterior covariance centered on the map point with a covariance operator that's taken as the inverse of the Hessian, the Hessian of the negative log posterior. And that's what this uh, shows us here, which says that there's large uncertainty, this is standard deviation, large uncertainty in the interior, but much reduced uncertainty out uh, near the ocean in regions where the ice is flowing most rapidly or there's a large velocity gradient of the surface. And this is a reconstruction of the surface uh, velocity. So the, the forward model here is a non-Newtonian shear thinning fluid, so-called full Stokes equations. Uh, but the idea with, the, uh, with optimal experimental design is once we're able to solve this inverse pr problem uh, in, in at least an approximate Bayesian sense, then we like to uh, gain greater information, reduce the uncertainties even further, uh, in this case by uh, drilling ice cores in various locations. So there are some ice cores in Antarctica, but there are campaigns now to deploy new ice cores. And this is essentially the only information we have through the thickness of the ice, on average two kilometers over you know, a, a continent that extends several thousand kilometers. So where do we put these ice cores? Uh, and the idea of posing this as an outer optimization problem that has the Bayesian inverse problem as an inner problem, and asking where do we place the ice cores in such a way that we gain the most information about, in this case, the parameter field. And this is going to be, me we'll measure this in expected information gain. So it's the KL divergence between the prior and the posterior. So we'll, we'll talk about this. Of course, ultimately, I don't care about this parameter at the base of the ice sheet. I care about the flux of ice into the ocean. You know, the, around, the, uh, around the boundary. And so one can pose this as a goal-oriented optimal experimental design. So we try to gain the most information about the push forward of the posterior covariance through the map to the flux. OK, that's one example. Here's another one. I won't belabor these. Uh, this is global seismology, given seismometers uh, in, that are dense in some regions of the planet and very sparse in others and, and almost non-existent in the oceans. We'd like to recover the seismic uh, wave, uh, seismic velocity of the Earth, mechanical properties of the Earth. Uh, here you see a Bayesian inversion uh, that starts off. This was a, a synthetic problem intended to illustrate. Uh, so we have seismometers just in the northern hemisphere, 
uh, and no coverage in the southern hemisphere. And you see little change between the prior in gray and the posterior in blue. These are marginals, so we've integrated out you know, everything but one dimension. And in the northern hemisphere, you see considerable reduction in uh, variance. And so now there are campaigns to instrument the seafloor, especially in sub subduction zones like uh, the, the one off of Japan or the Cascadia Trench uh, in, um, in the Pacific Northwest of the US, which is due for an earthquake any time now, they tell us. Uh, and uh, so the question is where to put these seismometers. You know, the idea is you'd like to infer the most about the, the, the structure and the state of the subduction zone. And finally, here's the third one. This is, this is actually Cascadia, a tsunami early warning system. There's a plan now to instrument uh, place instruments, uh, seafloor acoustic uh, device uh, sensors uh, through, you can see here, this fiber that connects all of these. So it's a cable, a cable system. And the question is where to put this in order to provide the best information about the seafloor uplift in the seconds after uh, a major rupture in order to provide an early warning. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, the expected information gain as the objective function we're going to try to minimize. Uh, so just, to, just for the setup, I'll give you some of my notation. Uh, this is, so abstractly, the forward model depends on states U, model parameters M. This is an homage to Alberto Tarantola that Michael mentioned, uh, who was just in this neighborhood here, did his work. M is the model parameter. Uh, here, you know, we take it to have a, a prior that's Gaussian, mean M prior, covariance C prior. Uh, the observation process, again, here, we're taking to be additive Gaussian noise centered on zero with some noise covariance gamma n, some observation operator uh, script B, and the actual observations Y. Bayes' theorem uh, posed infinite dimensional form is that the radon nicodem derivative of the posterior covariance with respect to the prior is given by the likelihood, where the likelihood takes this usual form when you have Gaussian additive noise. Okay. Now, what is the expected information gain objective? And uh, the information gain comes from the KL divergence, kullback leibler divergence, from prior to posterior. And that's represented in blue here. Uh, the problem is this depends on the data. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. And it becomes the expectation over the data of this, this KL distance. So the KL distance. Um, is, is, is uh, given in this line over here. Uh, the log of the posterior over the prior, uh, the expected value of that with respect to the posterior integrated over parameter space. The problem is this is intractable, in fact, doubly intractable to, to try to do, particularly with straightforward Monte Carlo, because there is an inner integral to do for the KL divergence. So one would have to integrate this over parameter space. Uh, and then there is an outer integral over the, you know, the expectation over the data. So you can synthesize the data from the prior, generate prior samples, noise realizations. This gives you data realizations. And then you can, you can Monte Carlo approximate this integral uh, like this. But then the KL divergence has to also be integrated. You know, and if you do this you know, brute force by Monte Carlo, you have Monte Carlo within Monte Carlo. It's hopeless. So um, we'll consider the following approximation, and that is the Laplace approximation, uh, which I mentioned briefly before. The Laplace approximation uh, is, as I said, it's a Gaussian centered on the map point, maximum a posterior point, with covariance given in, in a second. I'll, I'll show you. So the map point is the point that maximizes the posterior covariance or minimizes its negative log. And that gives us the familiar you know, regularized least squares, if, if you will. Uh, where the prior covariance plays the role of the regularization operator uh, and the data misfit is weighted by the noise covariance inverse. Uh, so, you know, we can exploit fast, scalable algorithms to find the map point, and then at the map point, construct the posterior covariance. Its inverse is given by the Hessian of this negative log posterior, which in particular consists of two parts, the Hessian of the data misfit term, which will denote H sub M, and the inverse of the prior operator. Uh, so if we, if we invoke a Gaussian approximation, it's not necessary, but for simplicity here, if we invoke a Gaussian approximation, J is the fresh derivative or, or the Jacobian of the parameter to observable map. 
This is all evaluated at the map point, uh, and J star is its adjoint. Uh, and in this case, when you have the divergence between two Gaussians, you can write down the KL divergence uh, between two Gaussians. You can write it down explicitly. And we get log determinant of the identity plus this so-called prior precondition data misfit Hessian. That's the, the data misfit Hessian preconditioned by the prior. And there's another term involving the trace of the posterior precondition data misfit Hessian and then this, this simpler term over here. Now, I'm proud of myself that I, I can write this down, and this, this holds in infinite dimensions also, but it looks hopeless to calculate. So what I, what I want to convince you is this is actually, not only can this be computed, but it can be computed in a scalable way. By, and when I mention scalable here, I don't mean scalable with respect to the number of processors, That's, you know, that can be done, of course, but scalable with respect to the number of forward solves, whether it's linearized, forward adjoint, tangent linear model, second order adjoint, so the, the number of forward souls is bounded, it's a fixed number independent of the parameter dimension and the sensor dimension. You can compute these quantities. How do you do that? Well, you recognize that this first, uh, that, that this prior precondition data misfit Hessian is typically a compact operator. The eigenvalues collapse. You can work them out for simple model problems, sometimes exponentially, sometimes algebraically. Sometimes they don't collapse, like high frequency Hemholtz. That, that is, as the frequency goes up, the decay of the eigenvalues is uh, slower. Uh, but for most cases, and I'll mention a little bit at the end about what can be done about that, but generally, you know, one has decaying, rapidly decaying eigenvalues. I'll give you some numerical uh, examples in a minute. And because of this rapid decay of the eigenvalues, uh, which is essentially a reflection of the opposedness of the inverse problem, the fact that the data contain limited information about the parameters. And when I say parameter, I mean broadly, it could be the state, it could be the initial conditions, uh, boundary conditions, source terms, geometry, even coefficients. So I, I mean the term very broadly. Uh, so the limited information of the data informing the modes and parameter space, so that accounts for rapidly decaying eigenvalues. Uh, and then, of course, if you have finite dimensional data, that causes you know, a, a, an immediate truncation of the eigenvalues. So the idea is we make a low-rank approximation of the Hessian. Now, the problem is, uh, easier said than done, how do you make a low-rank approximation? Um, well, we'll get to that in a second. When you, when you can make a low-rank approximation, the log determinant term uh, takes this form, where clearly when the eigenvalues are small relative to 1, you can truncate, so choose r when lambda is, let's say, 0.1. And this trace term, you can truncate it again when the eigenvalues are small to 1. So when the eigenvalues are small to 1, that gives you license to truncate. Uh, now, the only problem is how do we compute the eigenvalues? of this Hessian, this prior precondition Hessian, an operator that you cannot form. You cannot form Hessians. Each column of the Hessian requires a, a linearized forward solve, the tangent linear model. So uh, fortunately, over the last decade, what has emerged are random, randomized eigensolvers, randomized SVD in, in the specific case. Uh, they can extract an accurate approximation of the dominant eigenvalues. When you have decaying eigenvalues, they can do so at a cost measured in PDE solves uh, that is independent of the parameter and data dimensions depends only on the amount of information contained in the data, the so-called information dimension. Okay, and the beauty is these randomized eigensolvers only require actions of the Hessian in a direction, in a random direction, and they require order R of those, where, again, R is the effective rank. Uh, so I, you know, here's the algorithm, I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on it. The main thing to recognize is you're forming actions of the Hessian, the preconditioned Hessian, with a random matrix which there's several choices, but with a Gaussian IID random matrix, you're forming just matrix vector products. This is a tall and thin matrix that has R random columns, and there's some linear algebra that you do. That's independent of the number of solves. So the important thing is every Hessian vector action is a pair of linearized forward model, forward and adjoint model solves, the tangent linear model and the second order adjoint. Uh, okay, so there's some error estimates. I'll skip over those, but here's a nice paper in the SIAM review uh, by uh, P.G. Martinson, Joel Tropp, and, and their student, that essentially says that the error is within a constant factor of the optimal that you would get from standard truncated SVD. So the, the random algorithm comes within a constant, controllable, con uh, controllable constant uh, of the optimum that SVD gives you, which is essentially the discarded uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so here's an example uh, just to convince you that um, this Antarctica problem enjoys these same benefits. This is the decay, upper left image here is the decay of the eigenvalues. Uh, if you fit this to a curve, you get something like one over i cubed. So, you know, it's algebraic, it's not exponential, but it's, you know, it's rapid decay of eigenvalues. 
This is for two meshes. So the mesh here corresponds to the boundary condition, the coefficient of the boundary condition, the base of the ice. So these are meshes in, on a two-dimensional surface. And the, uh, there's, the, there's a refinement of the meshes. And what you see is the, the curves lie on top of each other. So not only is R bounded independent of the uh, parameter uh, dimension, but as you, as you refine the mesh, you know, the curves sit on top of each other. So further refinements don't help you. And the reason for that is, as you can see from these select uh, eigenvectors, so this is the first, the seventh, the 100th, 500th, and 4,000th uh, out of 5,000. Just a few that we picked out. Uh, these are smooth. Uh, and once you have a certain mesh resolution, any further increase in parameter dimension is not going to give you any, any more information. This is the 4,000th one, which is sort of the limits of about where we cut off. Uh, and you can see there's small scale information. In certain regions, very large scale information that can only be informed by the data in other regions in the interior, but where you have these rapidly flowing ice streams. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence between the ice streams and, and where the smallest length scales of these highest eigenvectors that are, uh, that are observable from the data. Now, the remaining, the remaining these are 4,000. It sounds like a large number, and it is. This problem has a reasonable amount of information. You have an entire surface from satellite data. It's a thin ice sheet. The map from, you know, you have a two kilometer map from the boundary condition up to the surface, but there's sufficient information loss that 4,000 out of 1.2 million, you know, those are the only modes you can infer. The remaining 1.2 million minus 4,000, uh, the prior fills in. That's it. Okay, um, so given that, uh, we can choose the, um, so how do we choose the design? Well, we'd like to uh, have one where we have a sensor and, and zero where we don't. So now I'm going to talk about sensor placement specifically. Of course, this applies to what you measure and where you measure it and how often you measure it, any aspect of, of acquisition system. But I'm going to talk specifically about placing sensors. And that just changes how you define the design variables. Here the design variables are simply the uh, weight wi is one if you have a sensor, zero if you don't. Now, that's a combinatorial problem. That's also not. You know, another thing is difficult to, to solve. So instead, we relax the, the binary constraint, and we say that the weights are between 0 and 1. And then we impose a sparsifying penalty. So sparsifying penalty is essentially continuation from L1 down to L0. Uh, you know, once we get below L1, we're no longer convex. But that's life. Nothing is convex. Anyway, the data misfit is con it's non-convex. Uh, so you know, th this doesn't hurt. But you know, at least L1 is convex, and we can start with that and then do the continuation, shrink epsilon using the previous solution as initial guess. Uh, and this pushes you towards a sparse design, and, you, and you'll see that in, in a second. Um, and so we weight the likelihood with this, this uh, noise covariance. We simply weight it by the diagonal of these, uh, these weights. Now, the challenge is that the data misfit Hessian precondition depends on the weights explicitly through here. That's fine. We can optimize for that. But it also depends on the map point, because it's the Laplace approximation. And the map point further depends on the weights. Uh, and you can see that here. So this is the optimization problem we solve, finally. Um, you saw the, with, the, with the randomized SVD truncation of the eigenvalues, the log determinant term and the trace term amount to these uh, sums involving the eigenvalues of the prior preconditioned Hessian. Where do these eigenvalues come from? We have to solve an eigenvalue problem. And that eigenvalue problem, the Hessian involves the Hessian as the operator. It's evaluated at each map point. Remember, there's an expectation on the outside expectation over the data. So each, we have to solve multiple Hessian eigenvalue problems. Uh, and uh, we, we have to solve these for, for the eigenvalues up to the rth eigenvalue. Um, and yeah, so that's the eigenvalue problem. And it depends on the map point, which depends on the weights. How does the map point depend on the weights? Well, it depends on it by solving an inverse problem. So we have a Hessian eigenvalue problem with an embedded inner inverse problem. Uh, and this inner inverse problem is to find the map point to, you know, to, to maximize this, um, yeah, to, to minimize this, uh, this uh, regularized data misfit. And uh, of course, the weights show up in here. So the map point depends on the weights through here. You have to solve these. It's a bi-level optimization problem. I, I won't talk about how you do it. You can actually do this quite efficiently. Um, well, efficiently is in quotes. Everything is in quotes. Uh, but it, it can actually be done. Uh, by adjoint methods, you have to just write a big, massive Lagrangian for all of this that involves the Hessian. Of course, the Hessian, you have to write it out as the action of the tangent linear model and the, um, and the second order adjoint in a direction and use randomized SVD. So all you ever need is the Hessian action. Okay, so let's do that. Here's a model problem. It's a Poisson coefficient. It's a simple problem. 
uh, what I want to argue is that this, the Laplace approximation of the EIG, uh, if you plot it against the true EIG, this is double Monte Carlo, so go off and solve 1,000 inner Monte Carlo samples, 1,000 outer Monte Carlo, so a million altogether, and compare it, plot against the Laplace approximation, which is you know, orders of magnitude cheaper, and you get a beautiful correlation. And moreover, when you solve the optimization problem, uh, the designs that you get, this is, this is for various test cases, they come out to be uh, superior to, to any of these random designs. So these are just random designs that we took, placed sensors in different locations, um, and uh, the optimal ones, oh, this is not a proof, but it's, a, you know, it's at least evidence that in, in this case, uh, this approximation is sufficiently useful for placing the sensors. It may not be the best estimate of the posterior covariance, it is an approximation, but at least for placing the sensors, it does a good job. Um, this is the effect of the sparsifying penalties. Um, so this is L1. I'm not showing you less than one. You know, the L1, you know, it's a standard uh, 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 absolute value. But I'm not showing you the weights less than zero because they're bounded between zero and one. And this shows you a continuation from blue to green to red to uh, turquoise. Uh, as we're approaching L0, we never have to go all the way to L0. And you can see the sensors, if, if you just use L1, you know, L1 is not, L1 promotes sparsity, but it doesn't, it doesn't guarantee sparsity. The whole point of compressive sensing is that under certain properties, L1 is equivalent to L0, but we don't have those properties here. These are too complicated, these problems. So instead, what we get is that a, if you follow this continuation, where epsilon is a parameter that, that controls how, you know, how much you move towards L0, what you get is an increasingly sparser set of sensors. And finally, for a certain choice of the, you know, the third one, that we, the fourth one that we chose, you get the, the weights essentially all one or zero, as shown over here. OK. Um, now, uh, I argued that the, that the scalability measured in number of times I have to solve the forward problem, the linear algebra is in the noise. We don't, we don't count that. Uh, this is with, uh, with the design dimension. So this is the number of sensors. And in fact, there is weak increase. This is, um, this is the total number of times I have to solve the forward model. It weakly increases forward, adjoint, and uh, these are the second order for, uh, forward and adjoints. Um, there's a, this is a factor of uh, 64 increase in the number of sensors. And there's about a factor of five increase in the number of PDEs that we solve. This is solvable. It's because we're using a quasi-Newton method, which uh, doesn't have the Newton methods um, uh, invariance to problem dimension. So if we switch to a Newton method with a lot of extra pencil and paper work, uh, this could be taken care of. We can get a flat curve here. Uh, on the other hand, all of the computations that relate to the parameter dimension that sits inside finding the map point and finding the dominant eigenvalues of the Hessian, all of those scale with parameter dimension. You know, as I argued, there's only a certain amount of information contained in the data, and that can only tell you so much about the parameters, and that's fixed. That's a function of the data. It doesn't have to do with the parameter dimension. You do have to put down a fine mesh at some point in order to capture that information. You don't know where to put the mesh. But anyway, if you increase the parameter dimension over, this is over a factor of 64, the number of PDE solves is essentially flat. OK, so that's the good news. Now the bad news. Well, this is just a summary of what I said. I'm, I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, but in the last minute or two, uh, I, I do want to say, uh, this is still far too expensive for large-scale problems. Uh, the notion that we're going to solve an optimization problem that includes the Hessian as a constraint, meaning we need third derivatives in the, in the, in, um, in the objective just to get a gradient, uh, is a non-starter with any large you know, production code. We do these things. We're, we're using, we, I can talk offline, we're using a modeling system that lets us express everything at a high level. Phoenix, uh, you can write things in variational forms. You can actually use built-in uh, adjoint derivatives. Uh, and, and we've also done this in C++, larger scale C++ codes. But um, th this is still far too expensive. So in the last few minutes, um, can we do something that is equally effective uh, but is uh, much cheaper? And so the idea is the following. Uh, why should we train? I mean, this is essentially these are, um, you know, th this uh, drawing realizations of the data and asking the optimal experimental design uh, to give us the most information with respect to the sensor locations uh, for all of this training data. Uh, this training data doesn't have to invoke the solution of an inverse problem. We don't need this inner inverse uh, problem. Um, I mean, if you follow the Laplace approximation exactly, then this is what it tells you to do. But that's an approximation anyway. So we, make, we, we further relax that idea. We say that simply we're going to evaluate the, 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 the uh, realizations of the data that we draw um, we're not going to use those to solve an inverse problem. Instead, we're going to uh, draw uh, samples from the prior, and we're simply going to train on those, on those samples. So we've the Hessian is going to be evaluated not at the map point, uh, but 
um, it's going to be evaluated at these samples of the prior. So we're asking the, the observational system to be optimal with respect to these prior samples. Okay? Um, and in this case, then, things simplify tremendously. The, this, the, I'm showing you the log determinant here uh, term. The trace is similar. Uh, so what happens is the, lo the influence of the weights is only in this weighting matrix here. In particular, the things that involve the forward model, the Jacobian uh, of the parameter to observable map, this no longer depends on the map points. So we don't have to go off and solve an inverse problem that is embedded inside the optimizations. So we have to differentiate through an inverse problem. We don't have to do that. Um, the, we can uh, offline, we can do a low rank approximation of this Jacobian, right? Because W is the only thing that the weights depend on. So let's get all of the forward solves out of the way. Let's do a low rank approximation. We use randomized SVD. It's, it's similar to the algorithm you saw before, tailored to the SVD setting. So we do a low rank approximation. Uh, the, the vectors uh, u form a basis for low dimensional parameter space. The vectors phi, uh, v uh, form a basis for low dimensional data space. These are the most important directions in data space. This is a subspace in data space that in, most informs the data. And then u are the, the directions of parameter space that are most informed by the data. Both of those are low dimensional. Uh, you saw in the Antarctica problems 0.1% or something, uh, or what 1%. On the other hand, other problems we get 0 0.1%, 0 0.01%, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, so using this offline computation, we never have to touch the PDE. So you can go solve this optimization problem without touching the PDE. Um, and maybe I have time to show you one. Uh, oh, and, and then uh, it's a greedy algorithm. I'll, I'll skip that. I'll skip that. OK. Uh, so here is just an infection diffusion problem. Uh, it's a simple uh, flow problem here, a simple, simple flow with uh, this is a sort of a driven cavity. Uh, there's an initial condition. We're trying to invert for the initial condition. We have potential observation locations uh, here. And um, uh, there's a, a greedy optimization, uh, which I didn't, I didn't mention. But I'll say it briefly. So rather than use this L1 continuation down to L0, and even though we're not solving PDEs, you know, maybe we pay attention a little bit to the, the cost of this optimization problem. There's no forward models involved. Uh, but rather than do that, we, we do a simple greedy algorithm in which we uh, look at the, um, uh, at the uh, at, at this log determinant of this function. We have Boolean matrices sitting in the inside. And what we do is we uh, permute rows and columns in order to minimize this, uh, this log determinant. In other words, we, we place a sensor somewhere uh, and ex we essentially exchange rows uh, and we bring in a sensor in one location. If it results in reduction in the log determinant, we, we, we accept it. Otherwise, we continue permuting. There's a fixed number of operations that you carry out. Uh, it, there's essentially ordered uh, D, R operations. Uh, this is all linear algebra. It doesn't involve the, the, the PDE. Anyway, it turns out this greedy algorithm, for reasons that we're trying to understand and study, it, it provides you know, much better or you know, always better solutions than random designs. Um, and uh, well, this is an example here uh, showing you the reduction uh, in this approximate Laplace approximation of, of expected information gain. So this is this, this, approximate, this, this approximate objective function. This shows you the decay of the eigen, uh, sorry, uh, of the singular values. Uh, so this is the singular values of this Jacobian of the parameter to observable map. This is the reduction as the number of sensors goes up, but also the number of parameters. So just refining mesh, number of parameters goes up, numbers of sensors go, go up. And they all sit you know, more or less on top of each other. We're already six or seven orders of magnitude reduced in the singular values. Uh, these are, this is probably some numerical error. But what it's telling you is that there is a, effectively an intrinsic low dimensional uh, subspace uh, for this Jacobian. And that's the important thing. And when you try to set the, uh, OK. So um, Alberto is signaling me. So I'm going to. Um, Stop with these final comments. The Laplace approximation is accurate and scalable, but it's not efficient. There's, there's a constant, and you know, it doesn't matter if the number of PDEs you have to solve is bounded. If that bound is thousands or tens of thousands or millions, that doesn't help you. Uh, this new approach uh, appears to achieve the efficiency and scalability in, in terms of independence of parameter and sensor dimensions. And there's a few components that it took to get there. But this is preliminary work on model problems. We have to test it out on more complex problems to see if this thing will actually work. And we're currently implementing this in the MIT GCM for ocean observing uh, system design in the Arctic. And here are just a few references. Thank you very much for your attention.
No, no, no. Yeah, sure. There's a question for Italian. Let me give you the microphone because I said it. So for the randomized SVD, you need, you need a steep spectrum, right? Uh, for the for the randomized SVD to be efficient, you need you need a, yeah. a steep spectrum. Yeah, but, yeah. But that that will depend very much, I guess, on your. So for instance, if you do this Jacobian times c to the power half, right? So, so that one that you need in the efficient algorithm. Um, so then, but that I mean the spectrum for this. No, actually, the, uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, that's right. So, th and that shows up. The, the reason why, um, the reason why you need the uh, steep spectrum. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. Is uh, this expression uh, right but here, which says that the coefficient, mm -hmm. the constant in front. So, this is the optimal from. S no, no, I un you know, understand yeah. that. So, so the question is, um, but that will depend very much on your observing system. If that, because because you do you do you do uh, the well, Jacobian the, uh, sorry the, yeah the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. J times times your Absolutely. the square root right. of your yeah. prior yeah. matrix uh, yeah every problem I've seen in thirty years has has a rapidly decaying spectrum with the with the exception of high frequency Hemholtz it's a fundamental loss of information um, but the, in fact you can I mean you can work you can prove these things analytically for simple model problems yeah. that admit these kinds of analysis uh, but even if you take infinite dimensional data you still have the, the rapid decay. If you don't have the decay, and there will be problems there that don't have yeah. that decay, in which information is preserved, you know, Michael uh, talked about advection preserving information. Um, if you if you're really going to get a million independent, okay, then th this is this is global low rank. It's not going to work. Uh, H matrices are an interesting alternative. We, we just have a first paper out uh, exploring H matrices for high frequency Hemholtz. Uh, an H matrix, you know, the the off the, the you don't. It's not a global low rank. It's the off diagonals that are locally low rank. The main diagonals are, are, are tightly coupled, and the off diagonals are low rank in a hierarchical way. So you, you build a sort of a, a tree. We should, we should talk. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay.